Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner, and I'm so excited you've joined me for this program because today I'm going to begin sharing with you my testimony. And today, and in the next nine programs, I'm going to take you into the history of Rick and Denise Renner and really share our life with you. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 29, that God chooses those that are unlikely. That's us, and I want you to hear our story. So let's get started. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. This is Rick Redder, and today I'm sitting in the auditorium of the old Glenwood Baptist Church. This is the church where I grew up. Now, when I was growing up, it did not look like this because this is a renovation, but this really is where I grew up. In fact, I'm happy to tell you that I'm seated right in the very place where I gave my heart to Jesus. I wanted to sit here today while I spoke to you. That day came when I walked the aisle and I took the hand of my pastor. I was a five-year-old boy. And I said, Pastor, I want to give my heart to Jesus. It happened right here just in front of me, in front of where I'm seated right now. They led me to this place. I got on my knees. My Sunday school teacher joined me. His name was Jerry Salone. And the two of us prayed together. And I sat here and watched as my mother began to move out of the choir loft, to step down to the steps, to come and join me. And soon I made my public profession of faith in Christ. That afternoon, the pastor came over to our house. He wanted to talk to me to really make sure I understood what I had done. And that night, I was baptized in the baptistry in this auditorium. The baptistry was so old that it had a picture of the Jordan River painted on the back wall. And in fact, this auditorium was so old and so undeveloped back in those days, I can remember the circulating fans that hung all over the auditorium. And on the back wall of the auditorium, there was a Dr. Pepper clock to let us know what time it was and when the service should be dismissed. It was just a different time and a different age back in those days. But this was Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tulsa was booming in the late 50s. And that's where I grew up. I was born in 1958. But our family came to Tulsa much, much earlier. In fact, my family moved to Oklahoma before it was a state. Oklahoma became a state in 1906. But our family came much, much earlier when it was Indian Territory. In fact, my family came so early to the state of Oklahoma that my great-grandmother Miller was one of those who actually ran in the Oklahoma land rush. She became one of the last survivors of the land rush and was even interviewed by the Tulsa newspaper in 1946. They wanted to capture her memories of what it was like to run in the Oklahoma land rush. But the reason my family came to Oklahoma is this. My great-great-grandfather was one of the multiple band directors for the legendary P.T. Barnum, who was the great circus man. And my family ended up with a circus, with a big tent, and they moved to Oklahoma, and they were the Miller Family Circus, and they were also comedians. I have family's photos showing our family with instruments and clowns. We even had elephants. We had everything. We were a real family circus. Well, Oklahoma Territory needed a circus. It wasn't even a state yet. It was the wild, wild west. In fact, one time my grandfather Miller, when he wasn't walking with the Lord in his earlier life, was thrown into jail in Oklahoma and guess who he shared his jail cell with. He was literally in jail with Geronimo. I can remember my great-grandfather telling me what it was like to be in jail with Geronimo. Well, that was my mother's side of the family. My grandfather Renner moved to America much, much later. He was a German immigrant. And when he came to America, Grandpa Renner couldn't speak a word of English. He couldn't read English. He moved to Oklahoma because he had two brothers who had also moved here. And when he came here, he taught himself to read. He taught himself to write, how to speak. He got a job. He began to educate himself and became an engineer. He really made something of himself. How I loved my Grandpa Renner. 
and my grandpa and grandma met in this area of Tulsa. They had children, Ronald Renner and Erlita Miller met, and guess where my parents met? They met right here. They met in this church. My mother and daddy gave birth to their children, me, Rhonda, and Lori. We grew up in this church. As far as we knew, there wasn't life beyond this church. This area of Tulsa wasn't considered to be the best area of Tulsa even back in those days. There were two railroad tracks, the river was nearby, and my family and all of our friends, we either lived right on the banks of the river or between the railroad tracks. We were on the other side of Tulsa. Probably it was considered to be not the best side of Tulsa, but it's all we knew. We didn't know anything else. You know, when you're young and you're happy, that's all that you know. We just knew that we were happy and our life literally revolved around this church. We were here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. If there was visitation on Saturday, we were here at visitation. If there was a revival meeting, we were in every one of those revival meetings. My mother was even the secretary for the pastor. We loved this church. And really the pastor was like the daddy of the whole congregation. I can remember him calling their renter kids down right in the middle of the service, telling us to quit chewing gum during the service because we were grieving the Holy Spirit. I can remember my mother coming out of the choir loft and sitting between me and my sisters so we would stop laughing during the service. Our whole life was right here. It was like a big family and a big party all the time. And in fact, we loved church so much that when church was finished, we continued. Sunday nights, we'd end up at somebody's house every single week, playing games, watching television, fellowshipping for hours and hours and hours. The church wasn't something we did. The church is literally what we were. It's all that we knew. Our friends were in the church. Our relatives were in the church. Our disagreements were between the members of the church. Our fun was with the members of the church. We were a part of the church bowling league. Ah, I grew up in the bowling alley because that's where the church was. Then on Thursday nights, we were at the baseball park because our church had a baseball team and my dad was the pitcher. When, when your dad is the pitcher, you're going to go to the game whether you want to go to the game or not. On the weekends, we were at the lake because that's where the church was. On Sunday afternoon, the guys would meet together and they would play baseball, so that's where we were. We didn't know anything but church. It was literally our life. And I'm so thankful that my parents raised me in that environment. I'm so thankful. The Bible tells us, in Proverbs 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. When the Bible says train up a child in the way he should go, it's very interesting in the Hebrew because it really describes the taste buds of a child. And that scripture is really saying if you give your child a taste for the Lord, if you give your child a taste for serving God, if you give your child a taste for church when he's young. If you develop that in his spiritual taste buds, when he gets older, he'll still have a longing for that. He'll still have a taste for that. I love the church today. I've given my life to serve God and to serve God's church. That's not a recent development. You know why I am what I am today? Because my parents gave me a taste for serving God when I was a child. Imagine, I walked the aisle and gave my life to Jesus Christ when I was five years old. You might say, well, can a child really understand at the age of five? Well, it depends on what kind of instruction that he has had. My mother would lay next to me in my bed every night and she would read to me from the Bible and my mother would talk to me about my salvation. That's my very earliest memory. I have such a love and such a fondness for my mother. How grateful I am for my mother. And my mother would say, Ricky, you need to give your heart to Jesus. 
My mother would talk to me about heaven. My mother would talk to me about hell. Don't be afraid to speak to your children about hell. They need to understand that hell is a reality. Friends, people may not talk about it much anymore, but hell is a real place, and you don't want your children or your family to go there. And my mother spoke to me passionately. She understood that I had to make a personal decision for Jesus. And I can remember the day that I made that decision. I was seated about halfway back in the middle of this auditorium, seated next to my sister, Rhonda. And suddenly the invitation began. We always had an invitation in our church. Does your church give an invitation? It's very important to have an invitation. The invitation began and the church began to sing, just as I am. That's what we nearly always sang. But on that particular Sunday, the Holy Spirit touched my heart. And in one moment, all those questions that my mother had been asking me began to resonate. It followed a moment after we had had a revival in our church. I'd been to that revival every night. We had a man who preached in our church, and I remember that one night he preached on the subject of hell. I was a five-year-old boy. Do you know that I can still remember that sermon on hell? He described the fires of hell as they swirled and turned and people burning in the fires of hell. And as a five-year-old child, it didn't terrify me, but it impacted me. And I realized if I died in my sin without giving my heart to Jesus, that's where I would go. That message and that graphic image really stuck with me. And some weeks after that, during the service, when the invitation began, it all came home for me. And I understood today is my day. I got up, I walked to the front, five years old, took the hand of the pastor, said, Brother Post, that was his name. We all called him Brother Post. I want to give my heart to Jesus. And I sat right here and gave my life to Jesus. Everything that I am, most of what I believe, what I believe about the church, what I believe about serving God, what I believe about missions, it was all formed in me right here in this place. But I want to tell you something unfortunate. The man who preached that revival, who preached that message on hell that made such a gripping impact on my life, later in life committed suicide. The evangelist committed suicide. Do you know why? Because he said he could see no long-term fruit of his ministry, and he became so despondent that he ended his life. I am part of the fruit of his ministry. He did not know what God was doing in me or what God was going to do through that little five-year-old who repented. What fruit could be attributed to him and to his preaching? And he died in vain thinking that his life had been fruitless. My friend, you're having impact. You may not see all the fruit that's being reaped through your life right now, but don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. God is using you in ways that you cannot imagine. That man ended his life, and here I am. God raised me up from this place and has used me to touch a nation of the world, and that man thought he had no fruit. I'm part of his fruit. You have fruit as well. But I grew up in this church. My sisters grew up in this church. <laughs> One of my sisters was married in this church. My grandparents, their funerals were in this church. Everything I knew about God, about life, it was right here. If it wasn't right here in this very building, it was at the baseball park or the bowling alley or the lake or after church every Sunday night or Saturday while we were cooking hot dogs with members of the church. It was between these railroad tracks and the river. We just lived here in this very sequestered area of Tulsa. And God was birthing in me love for the church, love for God's people, respect for spiritual authority. We really respected our pastor. And our pastor really had authority in our lives, and it was godly, and it was good. I saw a good example 
of spiritual authority, and he was quite a Bible teacher. And of course, today I'm a Bible teacher, and he would really lay doctrine out verse by verse, doctrine by doctrine. I would sit here in this church as I grew up, hearing the good Word of God, understanding how important it is that we build our life on the foundation of the Bible. Well, who am I today? That's who I am. All of that was laid in me right in this place. In fact, the first public sermon I ever preached was right here, just feet from where I'm seated. On a Wednesday night, Brother Post asked me if I wanted to preach. I couldn't believe it. Yes, I wanted to preach. I'd been waiting for that opportunity. I can remember the very first message that I preached. It was right here. In fact, I'm looking at the spot where I stood and where I preached my very first message on a Wednesday night. Well, that was all in good. But then something happened when I turned 12 years old. Can you imagine all of this happened? I wasn't even 12 yet. When I was 12 years old, I realized I was missing something. Surely there has to be more. I loved the church. I loved what I was learning. But I was hungry for the power of God. I wondered, why don't we see miracles? Why don't we see some of the things that we read about in the Bible? We were the Glenwood Baptist Church. We were what was called cessationists, which means we believed that miracles ended with the death of the apostles, that the supernatural and the miracles had ceased. We were cessationists. So we really didn't have room for that in our thinking. In fact, there was a woman in this church who got baptized in the Holy Spirit. She sat right back over there. And she was really ridiculed by the rest of the church. She was one of those and I remember thinking, it must be bad to be a Pentecostal. There must be something wrong with people that speak in tongues. Around the corner, there was another church called the Glenwood Full Gospel Church. That was a Pentecostal church. And we were told to be very careful about going near those people. So we had the impression that if you were a Pentecostal, there was something wrong with you. Maybe you were even mentally sick. We thought they were spiritually unstable. And by the way, back in those days, a lot of Pentecostal women didn't cut their hair. They didn't wear makeup. They wore funny-looking clothes. To us, Pentecostals were kind of like freaks back in those days. We were Baptists. We were progressive. We had fun as we served the Lord. And it seemed that those old Pentecostals were just legalistic and had strange hairdos. But I got hungry. And I began to think, Lord, is this all there is? You know, I'd been walking the aisle, recommitting my life to Christ. Got saved when I was five. <laughs> By the age I was 12, I already walked the aisle to recommit my life several times to rededicate myself. And Denise has the same story. Denise got saved when she was seven. She walked the aisle so many times to rededicate her life that her mother said, Denise, please stop rededicating your life. <laughs> That's all we knew. We wanted to know more of the Lord. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know where to go. All we knew we could do was just keep rededicating ourselves. Wow. But God had the baptism of the Holy Spirit waiting for me. I just didn't know about that. But there was a member of our family, my Aunt Melita, my mother's sister. And Melita had strayed from the faith. She also had been raised in this church, by the way. Melita was, grew up in this church as well. But she got married, and she became a Pentecostal. She strayed. And I can remember as a young boy thinking, wow, my aunt is a Pentecostal. I was a little leery of that because we really thought Pentecostal people were a little off their rockers. But my aunt had become a Pentecostal. And one day, I walked into her house after school. And guess what happened? She was listening to an old reel-to-reel -reel tape. That was before the day of cassette tapes. And she was listening to a message by Kenneth Hagin. And when I walked into her house, the door was open because back in those days, nobody ever locked their doors. I just walked into her house. If she knew that I was coming to her house, she probably would have turned it off 
in respect for my parents, whom she knew would not want me to hear this kind of preaching. So she didn't know I'd come into the house, and when I came into the house, I heard this old reel-to-reel tape, it was Kenneth Hagin, and suddenly he began to give a message in tongues. I remember thinking, oh my gosh, that's it. That's tongues. I'm listening to tongues. And a man gave the interpretation. His name was Brother Goodwin. He was a very dear friend of Brother Hagen, a very famous man. And I was stunned. I was like a paralyzed person standing in her house, listening to someone speaking in tongues. At just about that time, my Aunt Melita came around the corner and saw me standing there. Her eyes were like this because she realized little Ricky had been exposed to what the family never wanted little Ricky to be exposed to. But that moment set the hook in my heart. You know, sometimes today people are afraid that if they move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they're going to offend people. The gifts of the Holy Spirit don't offend people. They attract people. People are hungry for the supernatural. They're looking for answers. They want to see the miraculous. Don't be afraid that you're going to offend people. You don't have to be seeker sensitive. That's not in the Bible. Let the power of God operate. The power of God will put a hook in people's heart and pull them in. Jesus was not afraid to manifest the miraculous. He moved in signs and wonders. People did not run from him. They ran to him. And when I heard that message in tongues and the interpretation, I stood there like a paralyzed young boy. Melita came around the corner. She saw me with her big eyes, stunned that Rick had been exposed. And that's what began my real pursuit to know about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what I didn't learn in my church. I learned about the Bible. I learned a doctrine. In fact, even as a young boy, you could have given me a doctrine test. I would have passed the test. We knew doctrine in this church. The doctrine I learned in this church is still basically the same doctrine I have in my life today. But what I didn't learn in this church was about the moving of the Holy Spirit because we were cessationists. We didn't believe in the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. The only work of the Holy Spirit I ever personally saw, now maybe this is not true of everybody else, but for me, I'm speaking for me, was when people would come forward to get saved at the end of a service. The pastor would pray. He would say, Holy Spirit, do your work. I remember thinking, wow, this is the moment when that ghost begins to move in this auditorium. And I remember thinking the ghost is now going to move through the auditorium. And if anybody is in sin, the ghost is going to fall on them. To me, that was the moving of the Holy Spirit. But now I was learning there was something more. And it didn't scare me. It attracted me. It hooked me. And it began my pursuit to know the power of God. Do you know people that are hungry for the power of God? Show them, expose them to it. It will hook their hearts and it will pull them in. I like what Brother Hagin used to say. He used to say, if you get too close to the creek, you'll slip in. And when you get somebody really close to the power of God, It gets so slippery, they just slide right on into the power of God, and they are forever changed. When I begin to ask questions about the Holy Spirit, uh, people here did not really appreciate it. In fact, I was paraded into the pastor's office, the pastor that I loved so much, the pastor that had taught me the Bible. I sat across the desk from him as he began to lecture me. I can remember him looking into my eyes, pointing his finger at me, saying, Ricky Renner. Do you know what happens to people that speak in tongues? They are mentally unstable people. You do not want to become one of them. And he began to tell me story after story after story about unstable, unstable Pentecostals trying to terrify me out of pursuing a relationship with the Holy Spirit, but guess what? It was too late. It was too late for that because I had already been exposed to the miraculous realm of the Holy Spirit. I knew already there was more than what I had. Now I had been exposed to it, 
And it didn't matter how many threats or how many tales I heard about unstable Pentecostals. Too late for that. I had seen, I had heard, and I had determined I'm not going to stop until I step into a new dimension. Because of that, eventually I was pretty ostracized here. I was pretty ostracized because I went a different direction. But thank God I had the faith to follow my desire. And eventually it led me into the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But I'm so thankful to be here in this place, to be seated right here in the very spot where I gave my heart to Jesus, the place where I rededicated my life time and time again, where I grew up in Sunday school, in fact, my first job was in this church. I worked alongside of my father every Saturday. My job was to scrub the floors to remove all the black scuff marks before he waxed the floors because my father was the janitor of the church. I'm telling you, we were everything in this church. And my friend, I want to tell you, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. What I learned in this church is what I still have a taste for. And what you teach your child about God or your grandchildren, the taste you give them for serving God when they are young will stick with them. And when they get older, they will not depart from it. But when I'm here, I think about my childhood experience, my childhood salvation, learning to serve God. All of that began right here. What I am today is a result of what was instilled in me in this very place. Rick Renner, his wife Denise, and their three sons have lived a faith-filled adventure, pioneering a major work in the heart of the former Soviet Union beginning in 1991. Since that time, this work has impacted an untold number of lives. But how did this amazing story begin? What kind of miraculous events have the Renners encountered in this faith journey? In the 10-part series, Unlikely, our special gift to you today, you'll learn how unlikely Rick and his family were to be used in such a spectacular way in a foreign land. But God enjoys using those whom the world would never choose. If you feel unlikely to be used for God's purposes, this remarkable story will thrill your heart and give you the boost you need to know that God really wants to use you in a spectacular way too. And today it is our free gift to you, available in digital or physical formats. You could receive Unlikely when you call or go online to request it. It is our gift to you. Don't wait to call right now so we can get this thrilling testimony to you. In addition to this teaching series, you can also purchase Chosen by God. In this book, Rick will prove to you beyond any shadow of a doubt that God's hand is on you and he has chosen you to do something marvelous with your life. Chosen by God can be yours today for only $18. Don't miss this special offer, Unlikely, our free gift to you and Chosen by God for $18. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. One request per household, U.S. mailing only. 